On the left hand side, we asked ourselves as we were going around and as we were observing, we asked ourselves, what do we see? And what do we see almost everywhere? What do we see that's powerful, that's inspiring, that's working, that people are making things happen, where people are making things happen, where people are ensuring that things are working? And we found over and over again five key networks. There are others, but these five networks were really key. The first one is mobile phones. As, as you will know, across East Africa, as in other parts of the world, the mobile phone phenomenon has been incredible. We've moved from a situation 15 years ago where there were probably, there was one telephone for every thousand people to a situation now where it's, it's almost everyone has a phone either directly or indirectly. And phones are everywhere. And, and it's, 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 it's transformed what it means for people here on the ground. In the past, when a leader came and said, this is it, it was it. That was it. Because you had no other way of knowing what else. Um, if you wanted to find out information about something, it might take you two weeks and a lot of money, which you may not be able to afford to get that. Now, you get it quickly in real time. You can get an SMS sent to you by a friend who is a thousand miles away. Mobile phones are making not only information possible, information flow possible, but you also have flows of money. Um, what was wonderful the other day for me to hear that there were top executives from Europe, from the mobile phone companies in Europe, coming to East Africa to learn how M-Pesa works, how you can do mobile banking, because East Africa is ahead of the game of view in Europe when it comes to doing mobile banking. So it has transformed things, and most importantly, what it has meant is that person, that woman in Sumbawanga over here, or that person in Athi River, is able to, in a sense, access the, the, the sorts of services and the types of information which before they were completely excluded from, before which were limited to a kind of middle class and rich in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, they have more access to right now. I could go on about mobile phones, but let me then talk about mass media. By mass media, we mean radio in particular, but also television and newspapers. Now, radio is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. And yes, it's one way, but it's, it's incredibly important. All the surveys will tell you, and if you spend time in the villages, you will see this with your own eyes, that people value the radio a lot. People will spend money to buy batteries. On this side, for somebody to show up to a workshop, you have to pay them to show up. But on this side, people spend their own money listening to the radio. And they, particularly the news is important, but also news programs. And what often happens is that when you hear something on the, on the radio that strikes you, or there's a program coming, you quickly send an SMS to somebody and say, hey, listen to this program. It's talking about something that will be really interesting. Um, so radio is something people care about. It tends to be more men than women. So there is a gender asymmetry over here. Uh, but, uh, and, and for some women, they only get this information secondhand. But it is very important. Television. Now, you might think that television, if you look at the data in terms of who has television, very few people have television. But that could be misleading because television in, in, in East Africa is not a private good, it's a public good. By which I mean television is a public, a communal event. You don't watch it in your living room, unless you happen to be very rich and in the city. You watch it in a pub, in a bar, at a community hall. How? Because television requires electricity. How does that work? Well, that works because there's some entrepreneur here, a group of women who have rigged a television with a generator, with a satellite dish, sometimes homemade, in order to be able to get television. And not only national television, but international television. You go to the most remote villages in Uganda, and you'll see a group of people, men but also young women, watching a game between Chelsea and Arsenal on a Saturday afternoon, and doing it avidly and with passion. And watching the news and the politicians and what they are saying, their hypocrisy, and all the wonderful things they do or may not do. And, and what, the, what the viewing of the television becomes is not only viewing, but it's also a social event. Because when you gather there, you're not only watching, but you're also discussing it. And newspapers are also important because while their reach is extremely limited, most villages, most rural areas, in, in fact, even most people in urban areas don't have access to the newspapers. But the newspapers are important because not only do they set the agenda for the policymakers, but also because they provide content for the radio stations. The way people read the newspaper is by turning on the radio at 7 in the morning and listening to the person on the radio read the newspaper in, in, in detail. 
So there's an ecology even within mass media between the TV, the radio, and the newspaper, where the newspaper provides the content for this, and what happens on TV is reported in the newspaper, and so on. Let me talk about another network that we find everywhere in every community across. And this is religion. In East Africa, religion is incredibly important. I met women in Uganda who would skip out on lunch, who would miss eating two or three lunches a week so that they can save the little bit of money to be able to contribute to church. I met young men in Dar es Salaam and in Nairobi and in Kampala to whom the most important organizing space was the Friday prayers or the time right after Friday prayers, more than anything that any youth organization had done. That is where they drew their inspiration from. That is where they, th they felt there was a space where their concerns could be honored, could be discussed, where they felt that they could sit together, analyze what was happening and figure out what we should do about it. The, the, the Islamic leaders in the communities often are the first resort for conflict solving, much more so than the formal systems of government on this side. Fourth is the consumer good network. It's, it's the things you can buy in the shops. For those of us who lived through Tanzania in the early 80s or, you've, or through the hard times in Uganda, we can really appreciate what it means to be able to have a little dukkha, a little kiosk, where you can get the basic things that you want. And again, this is particularly important for women. I'm talking about the little, little wooden shack where you can buy soap and matches and exercise books and pencils and flour and sugar and condoms and the basic essentials that people may need. And this is important because these goods matter to people. And they are sold in a, in a form and at a price that are affordable. There's also flexibility around this. If I don't have cash now, I can get things on credit or I can give you two kilos of flour in exchange for the soap that I need. But it's also important because this shop has often become the communal gathering point where information is exchanged, where you come not only to buy your soap, but to find out how do I do this or what's happening over there. Oh, I, I heard something on the radio that such and such a project is happening and I don't know what it means. So much more so than in the formal village governance meeting or the school committee meeting over here. It's these spaces where people learn and get the key ideas that they want. And finally, the fifth network that is really important is teachers. Because there has been an expansion of primary and secondary schooling across East Africa. There are teachers everywhere. And these teachers are incredibly important, not only because they are, they are responsible for the education of children, but they are really important because they fulfill a critical function in society in, in helping people negotiate the space between their lives and the opportunities here in a kind of outer world, a bigger world out here, whether it is on the left-hand side of how do I learn, how do I read the manual for my mobile phone or how do I figure it out? Or I hear there's a loan over here, how, how can I find out more about it? Or even things over here when you need to fill in a form, for example, or you need to know how to get your pension. It's the teachers who, who occupy the liminal space between life on the ground and, 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 and an official down there and can help you negotiate, negotiate that space. And the teachers' union, Chamacha Walimu Tanzania or Kunut in Kenya uh, or the one in Uganda, other than religion and other than the ruling parties, is probably the most important other mass institution in the country. These five networks, mobile phones, mass media, religion, consumer goods, the shop, and the teachers and the teachers' union, you will find virtually everywhere. If the government or anybody else tried to close these down, you'd have riots, you'd have problems. People would refuse to let that happen, or if it happened, it, another thing would bounce off. If you try to close down the shops, another shop would open up. People spend their own time and their own money to be able to access these sorts of things. Mobile phones, data in many countries shows that after food, people spend the most amount of money 
on mobile phones.